into this morning's sermon. Two chapters. The whole of two chapters. Saddle in. Here we go. You ever have anybody try to kill you? I, now, I, I asked that question and some of you are like, mm, not that I know of. And some of you are like, oh yeah, I can still see the guy's face. And so I'm going to ask that question both indirectly and directly because some of you have had somebody try to kill you and you just didn't know it because they did it indirectly. Oh, I don't know, say a drunk driver. You know, somebody got into a vehicle, messed up, and put your life in danger, whether you knew it or not. Or, you know, I think about those guys that have gone through combat, and, you know, sometimes the bomb explodes next to you, and it's not personal. He wasn't directly trying to kill you. It was just circumstantial. Or you think about another indirect way of somebody trying to kill you might be, you know, terrorism. It's not necessarily because I'm upset with you. I happen to be upset with your country. And so I want to take out Americans, or I want to take out Israelites, or I want to take out Ukrainians, or I want to take out whoever. And then there are those times where we have people that directly try to kill us. Some of you may have experienced that in some criminal form. Someone breaking the law and trying to take your life. Um, maybe you have an enemy that really hates you and really tries to take you out. And for some, those are experiences that you have had. And for some, those are experiences you haven't. As I was thinking through the list, I had to think, you know, yeah, I was in Iraq. I was in Balad, which we nicknamed Mortaritaville, because the mortars fell daily. And so you got really accustomed to 15 to 20 mortars a day, just hitting the base where we were at. Why? Because they were trying to kill us. Were they mad at me personally? No, not at all. They were just hoping to hit something. They were really bad shots and they rarely hit anything. But the fact of the matter is, it was a little disconcerting to have somebody trying to kill you on a daily basis. I remember in high school, I had a young man that was a high school bully. I'll not name him. Uh, he knows who he is, even though it was eons ago. And, you know, he might actually trip into a sermon sometime and if he ever hears and wants to come and apologize, I'd love to see him again. Um, but I can tell you it's already forgiven. When we were 15, he was a bully. And he and his two friends bullied me and bullied me and bullied me. I mean, putting all kinds of foul things in lockers, destroying woodshop projects, screaming all sorts of things around campus, calling me all kinds of names. And then one day on the way home from school, he followed me. I was walking with my best friend and didn't think much of it. They generally went the same direction, he and his friends and me and my friend. And so I didn't think anything of it until we were crossing an open field and I heard that voice yell. And I turned around and he had stashed a twenty two rifle up under some brush in this field. And he was closer to me than was comfortable. But he was far enough away I couldn't get to him. And as I stood there looking down the barreling of a twenty two rifle and seeing the rivulet pattern going away from me, I thought, he's not going to miss. And my best friend standing there next to me, and I said, go get mom because my mother was in a vehicle just down the hill. And he said, no. And I said, go get mom. And he said, no. And I said, dude, go get help. He said, no. About that time, the young man lowered the weapon and laughed and walked away. We went and called the sheriff and they caught him before he even got home. I looked back over at my friend and I said, why in the world didn't you run when I told you to? He said, because he couldn't get both of us. 
if he shot you, I was going to take him out. If he shot me, figured you would. Have you ever had someone try to kill you? Because if you have, then you can appreciate these next few chapters. You can already pick up on what's going on in chapter 18, and you're going to pick up on what's going on in chapter 19 and 20, because Saul has decided David is going to die. He is actively, directly trying to kill him. We read across the Scriptures sometimes and we just go, oh yeah, Saul was a little upset with David and chases him around the country. No, he was trying to kill him. If he could have caught him, all of history would have changed. Here the anointed king of Israel is chasing the anointed king of Israel trying to kill him. And not lightly. Not hey, you know what, I think I might at some point take opportunity to cancel his breathing policy. No, this is an active king sending an army looking for an individual to kill him. And you need to understand that, else the other things that David will write and what goes on between David and these other characters will make far less sense. This isn't a movie. It's not a video game. There is no reset. This is an active murder in progress. And you have to understand that as we read. This is serious. You know, in chapter 18, Saul tried in a few ways, both direct and indirect, to kill David. He threw a spear at him twice. He sent him into battle. He made him a general so he'd be up front. So he's trying all these ways to get David dead. But here in chapter 19, he turns a corner. Here in chapter 19, it becomes intentional and vindictive. In today's reading, things are going to go far more serious than they have in the past. But in this story will be two individuals who deliver David from death. Join me, if you will, in 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. By the way, that's the king giving an edict. Okay? It's interesting that he gives it to Jonathan. Jonathan was very fond of David. <laughs> well, let's go back to chapter 18 where Jonathan makes a covenant with David for the rest of their lives because they have such a deep and profound love for one another. They are kindred spirits. They are both godly men that Jonathan will do just about anything for David and David will do just about anything for Jonathan. And so when dad looks over at Jonathan and says, go kill your best friend. Jonathan responds and warns David. My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding. Stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistines. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Let's say it together. Ah. Oh. I mean, thank you, Jonathan. 
saved that story from going really bad. Wow, okay, so we can relax. So why were you building us all up like you did? I mean, this, we got this thing settled. Uh, verse 8. Once more war broke out, and David went out and fought against the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. Pause. How do you think Israel responds to that? Uh, uh, you know, here's your main general out there taking names. Yay! David! Yay! David! Or as they said back there, what was it? Chapter 17? 18. Yeah, chapter 18, verse 7. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul was very angry, for this refrain galled him. Here again, the glory boy, the one I can't get rid of, keeps being successful. I swore I wouldn't kill him to Jonathan. Verse 9, But an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. Uh-oh. Now, some of you are having a real hard time with chapter 19, verse 9. How can a holy God send an evil spirit? Because ultimately, God is in control of everything, including Satan and his legions, and he can go, yes, or he can go, no. Satan cannot do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. But this doesn't say that God allowed him. It says that God sent an evil spirit. Why in the world would God send an evil spirit to harass somebody? For the same reason God does everything He does for people. The word is repentance. Not so that you'll go farther off the cliff, but so that you'll recognize, oh, I'm on the cliff, and take a step back. Remember that you can't demonstrate your righteousness unless you're tested. You can't pass a test unless you're tested. And so God will sometimes put you in a bad situation to see how you respond. Have you really learned patience? Let me pile it on you. Have you really learned to be loving? Let me put you with that person that irritates the fire out of you. You see, God is not punishing Saul. God is trying to redeem Saul. Here's a bad spirit. What are you going to do? Are you going to follow that bad spirit? I don't know about you, but I have, I wouldn't call it an evil spirit, but I have a tendency to get into the car and argue with people that aren't there and say things so that I win the argument. That is not godly. I am not proud of that fact. And that's an area of my life that God and I are working on because I will catch myself in sentence number three, really reading, reading somebody the riot act, and going, yeah, and... Hmm. Lord, I don't want to be that person. That's what's going on in verse 9. Saul, do you want to be that person? Saul, do you want to keep going down the wrong path? Saul, do you want to keep doing the wrong thing? Saul, are you going to keep doing what you're doing, or are you going to repent? You see, it's not that God sent an evil spirit on Saul to punish him. It's not that He sent him to set him up for failure. It's that Saul can't demonstrate whether he's following God or following evil unless he's put in a situation to choose. Same as you and I are. Now the reality is, we don't need an evil spirit to come up with dumb stuff. Amen? I do not need any help screwing up the planet. 
I can do it all by myself. Satan has a very easy job when it comes to me because I take very little incentive to do the wrong thing. The Holy Spirit's got His work cut out. Helping me to become the man God wants me to be. And I expect the same is true with each of you. So as we walk through this then, an evil spirit is sent from the Lord to Saul while he's sitting in the house with a spear in his hand. Decision point, what you going to do? Saul, verse 10. Saul tried to pin David to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. <laughs> hmm. That night, David made good his escape. I, I, I had to stop and laugh there because, you know, if I'm just trying to stick you, I don't push as hard as when I'm trying to pin you to the wall. The reason that David gets away is because Saul was trying to stab him so hard he got it stuck in a log. This wasn't this gentle, eh, 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 I really dislike you. No, he was trying to pin him to the wall and he hit that spear into that wall so hard he couldn't pull the spear back out. And David's able to get away before he can reload. He's trying to kill David. And Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning. But Michael... David's wife warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michael let David down through a window and he fled and escaped. Then Michael took an idol and laid it on the bed, covering it with a garment and putting some goat's hair at the head. And when Saul sent the men to capture David, Michael said, oh, he's ill. And then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. But when the men entered, there was the idol in the bed and the head was some goat's hair. And Saul said to Michael, let's put it in there, his daughter. Okay. Why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michael told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? Michael's quick. I like her. She's cunning. And here's Michael saves David through her wisdom and through her cunning. Don't miss the fact she just took her life into her own hands. I don't care if she is the king's daughter. He's mad enough to pin David to a wall and you aided and abetted him. That makes you the enemy. He could have just as easily killed Michael right there in his rage. But he doesn't. And she's quick enough to go, hey, look, I'm kind of caught between two people here. If I don't help you, you kill me. If I don't help him, he kills me. I'm kind of at a loss, Dad. Figure it out. And Dad lets her go. But I want you to notice, I mentioned back in chapter 18, that there were two people in Saul's household that loved David. Jonathan and Michael. And here, Jonathan and Michael have tried to help David and have been deliverers. Continuing. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel. <gasps> Samuel's still alive. Cool. He went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul. David is at Nioth at Ramah. So he sent men to capture him. <laughs> but when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came upon Saul's men and they also prophesied. <laughs> Saul was told about it and he sent more men and they prophesied too. Saul sent a third time and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great system at Sekiu, and he asked, where are Samuel and David over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. 
So Saul went to Nioth at Ramah, but the Spirit of God came even upon him. And he walked along prophesying until he came to Nioth. He stripped off his robes and also prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay that way all that day and night. Which is why the people say, is Saul also among the prophets? I love this. I'm going to kill David. No, you're going to have church. I mean, you can just see this going on. Here's these warriors. I mean, when he says he sent men to find David, these are not guys walking around in sandals and a nice flowing robe. These are soldiers. He sent a contingency of warriors to go kill David. And they get almost there and they start having church. They start praising God. They start prophesying. They can't kill David because they're in the presence of God and they're acting like it. Three different times he sends a platoon up. I mean, this is a chaplain's dream. I mean, I got all these warriors coming in my room and they're just like, it's time to praise God. Outstanding. Nobody's dying today. And then Saul, in his anger, comes look at which cracks me up because, you know, you got to wonder what's going on in the dude's head. Nioth at Ramah, Nioth at Ramah, Nioth at Ramah, so he goes to Sekhu. you. Why did you even go to the other town? Because when he gets to the other town, hey, where is everybody? Where have we been telling you the whole time? But anyway, he finally shows up, and he too falls back into that prophecy because remember that he was anointed by God and prophesied at one point in his career and that that Spirit of the Lord had been removed from him and that he's trying, God is trying and trying and trying to win Saul back. He's given him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Fine! Let you prophesy for a little while. Now, can you imagine standing there as David all right, Lord, here it comes. There's a whole platoon of them. It's me and the old guy. Okay, Samuel, what's up? How are we going to do it? Wait, they're, 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 having, they're having church. They're praising God. This is crazy. And then the next group. And then, the next, and then Saul comes in the room. Now, here's where I'm talking about that opportunity that we get every day. Saul is laying on the ground. David is the anointed king over Israel. It is completely within human logic that David would walk over and stick a spear through Saul. And we can stop this right now. Boys flopping on the ground. <sighs> but David chooses righteousness. David demonstrates his walk with God in that when they're praising, he's bailing. He goes off somewhere else. By the way, I want to talk to Saul's spirituality through his offspring. You see, I want to bring your attention back to something I completely skipped over, and I want to go make you go, hmm, you know, one of those things to make you go, hmm. What does Michael put in the bed to fake that it's David? An idol. What is David doing with an idol in his home? Um, it's not David. It's Michael. And we'll see this play out later in the story. Michael does the right thing here and she's a cunning young lady and she knows how to protect her husband and she knows how to disarm her father, but she's also not necessarily a God follower. Okay? And that's an important aspect to keep in mind, especially for those of you who are married to a person who does not share your faith. David, righteous king. Michael, not so much. And that's going to play out as we go through the story as well. Chapter 20. Then David fled from Naoth at Ramah, you know, while everybody else is praising God. I'm sure he said his amen, okay? David being a godly young man, I'm sure he praised God too, along with Samuel. And I'm, I, you know, it doesn't say it, but I'm pretty sure Samuel looked over at some point and went, run. 
You know, it's like, dude, why are you still standing here? Go, get, you know. He fled from, fled from Naoth and Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, what have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he's trying to take my life? Never! Jonathan replied, you're not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without confiding in me. Why would he hide this from me? It's not true. It's not so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. <laughs> you see, you all probably forgot how chapter 19 started. But Jonathan didn't. His dad, the king, made an oath. The boy will not be put to death. So when Jonathan hears about David having to run and do all of this crazy stuff, and David going, why is your dad trying to kill me? Jonathan is still stuck in chapter 7, or in chap verse 7, you know. Dad said, "You, it can't be. This isn't happening. David, I don't know what is going on, but it's not that. I, I think you're just getting paranoid, dude. But then when David takes an oath, Jonathan comes to his senses and goes, oh wait. I've only got one, so I'll need another battery before too much longer. Um, Jonathan, you know, we don't know what that oath that David says before God and before Jonathan is, we, we don't really know. Um, but it's enough to get Jonathan to open his eyes. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. So David said, look, tomorrow is the new moon festival and I am supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field. Sorry, got lost. Not because I was still looking too high, that's why. Until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he's determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never. Jonathan said, if I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? David asked, Why, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? Come, Jonathan said, let's go out into the field. So they went there together. Then Jonathan said to David, by the Lord, the God of Israel, I will surely sound out by my father by this time the day after tomorrow. If he is favorably disposed toward you, Will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to harm you, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. But show me unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, 
May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. This oath, this covenant relationship between Jonathan and David will will orchestrate how things are going to play out clear through the end of 2 Samuel. The entirety of David's reign will revolve around this oath. And I want you to see what Jonathan just did. I don't want you to miss that Jonathan just committed treason. His father is king and he just blessed his best friend. May God be with you. May God cause your enemies to fall before you. Oh, and by the way, I need you to promise that you will never kill me or my family. That sounds odd to our ear because we aren't the son of the king. And when you're talking with the man who you know will become the next king, kings in the ancient Near East, when the new king came in, he killed off the entirety of the old king's family. What Jonathan just said is, I know you're the man God has chosen. I know you're the one my daddy warned me about. I know and I bless you. I will protect you against my father. I will bless you. All I ask is that you bless my house. Don't kill me. When the time comes, don't kill me. And don't kill my children. So Jonathan turns a corner for us. This is the first clue that we have that anybody knows that David is the anointed king. That was a private thing between David and his brothers and Samuel. And he's been, all of these chapters, we're not really sure if anybody knows about it in the courtroom yet. And Jonathan says, yeah, I know. I know. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon festival. You will be missed because your seat will be empty. The day after tomorrow, toward evening, go to the place where you hid when this trouble began and wait by the stone azel. I will shoot three arrows to the side of it as though I were shooting at a target. Then I will send a boy and say, go find the arrows. If I say to him, look, the arrows are on this side of you, bring them here, then come, because as surely as the Lord lives, you're safe. There's no danger. But if I say to the boy, look, the arrows are beyond you, then you must go because the Lord has sent you away. And about the matter you and I discussed, remember, the Lord is witness between you and me forever. So David hid in the field, and when the new moon festival came, the king sat down to eat. He sat in his customary place by the wall opposite Jonathan, and Abner sat next to Saul. But David's place was empty. Saul said nothing that day, for he thought something must have happened to David to make him ceremonially unclean. Surely he's unclean. But the next day, the second day of the month, David's place was empty again. Then Saul said to his son Jonathan, Why hasn't the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered, David earnestly asked me for permission to go to Bethlehem. He said, Let me go, because our family is observing a sacrifice in the town, and my brother has ordered me to be there. If I've found favor in your eyes, let me get away to see my brothers. That's why he's not come to the king's table. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a... Now, you can fill that in the way the world does, and you're not wrong. You son of a perverse and rebellious woman. What is it with guys? When they get upset with their kids, they insult their wives. That just never makes any sense to me. But anyway, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you've sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send and bring him to me, for he must die. Uh, hello? Saul knows too. 
Saul was told, there's another guy and your son will never sit on the throne. And he just said to Jonathan, the reason that you won't sit on the throne is David. Go kill him. Saul knows too. You see, in in the prophecies of chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, Samuel had said to Saul, you've done a foolish thing. You've not kept the command of the Lord that God gave you. If you had, He would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after His own heart and appointed him ruler of His people because you've not kept the Lord's command. And then again in chapter 15, verses 23 and 26, For the rebellion is like sin of divination and the arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has rejected you as king. Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Saul has been trying to figure out who the prophetic word was about and he's got it. It's David. As long as that son of Jesse lives, all of these prophecies will come true. We have to kill him. Jonathan then responds, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father indeed intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. On that second day of the month, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. I want to stop that for just a second and take you one step back and remind you that Jonathan walked into a fist fight by his own self with his armor bearer and slaughtered 20 Philistines in a story a couple of chapters ago. And this old man chucks a spear at him. Okay, Dad, I'll give you your level of respect. I'll give you the honor you're due but you start chucking spears at people and it's on. Now that's a warrior's heart. Jonathan gets up from the table in a fierce anger. We almost have the overthrow of Saul's reign right here. Jonathan's like, dude, you want me to be king? There's a quick way for that. I put a spear in you, old man. He's a generation younger, faster, He could take him. But he, like David, chooses righteousness. He chooses to walk away and just be mad. His dad has lied. His dad has taken an oath and he's violated it. He's been doing all of these things to to condemn an innocent man. Jonathan's furious because Jonathan is a righteous man. He's a warrior that's pumped and is ready to respond In the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David. He had a small boy with him and he said to the boy, run and find the arrows I shoot. And as the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, isn't the arrow beyond you? Then he shouted, hurry, go quickly, don't stop. The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master, scratching his head and trying to figure out why Jonathan was off his rock. Because he's standing here looking at the arrow. No, it's past you. This one, keep running. I'm not running. I'm standing here. Don't stop. Keep going. Yes, sir. (laughs) You know, (coughs) the boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master. Parenthetically, the boy knew nothing of all of this. Only Jonathan and David knew. So the boy is not in on it. He's like, I don't know what's going on in Jonathan today. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said, go, carry them back to town. Do you see what he just did? He completely took all of his ability to defend himself away so that he could go talk to David. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed towards Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. This is what a covenant relationship looks like, friends. Both men honor the vow that they've made. 
Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. You ever had anybody try to kill you? 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around you like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. John chapter 8, verse 44, you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Hebrew chapter 2 and verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in the humanity, so that by his death, Jesus, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is, the devil. You see, you have an enemy. An enemy who is seeking to devour. A see, an enemy who is looking to destroy. An enemy who is a murderer from the beginning. A murderer, a, a, a enemy who holds the power of death. And we know from Job chapter 2 and verse 6 when the Lord says to Satan, very well then, Job is in your hands, but you must spare his life. He cannot act without God's permission, but he has the power. And all he needs is the authority. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 and verse 16. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Friends, Satan wants to destroy God's image on earth. That is a scriptural, spiritual truth that we all live with and know. But have you ever made it true to you? Because Satan intends to destroy God's image and drive it from earth. He wants to expel God's image completely. He wants to get rid of God. And oh, by the way, we were told in Genesis chapter 2, we were made in His image. Every time Satan looks at us, he sees God, and it's not a happy thought. You have an enemy. You see, Satan doesn't want to pull you off into sin so that he can giggle. He wants to pull you off into sin so he can destroy you so that He can rid the earth of God's image. If He can destroy you, He can destroy God's image. Satan isn't in some kind of a collection war. I got more than you did. No. You see, God wants you because He created you and He loves you. Satan only wants to kill you. Let's make that real this morning. You bring glory to God. Even when you're an unbeliever, you still bring glory to God. And so you this morning can answer, yes, someone is both directly and indirectly trying to kill you. His name is Satan. That's why Ephesians 6 says to put on the full armor. Because I want you to understand, I behaved differently in Iraq 
when I had people shooting at me and bombing me on a regular basis differently than I act in Eureka Springs. I don't wear body armor, I don't go around in up-armored vehicles, and I don't drive at 12 miles an hour because there might be an IED on the side of the road. I behave differently because nobody's trying to kill me. But the reality is, in the spiritual realm, there is someone trying to actively to kill you every decision every day every single day and i want you to understand that because just as there was michael and jonathan so there is jesus that god in his righteousness gave us a deliverer who will free us from the law of sin and death and bring us into a righteous existence that we have a choice and that we have the ability through the Holy Spirit to exercise that choice to be righteous rather than evil. We have a deliverer. And so I I don't want to over-dramatize this. I, I just want you to understand We don't have good days and bad days. We have righteous days and evil days. Because you are actively being sought out to be destroyed in the spiritual realm. And you've got to have your Jesus on so that you don't fall to the fiery arrows. So that you don't get flanked so that you don't get a knife between your guarding plates. Guys, there is a Savior. And that Savior is the one who has control over what Satan can and cannot do. If you do not have Christ Jesus, Satan doesn't need God's permission. You're already His. But if you give yourself to Christ, you have the Deliverer that can save you from destruction every single day. Heavenly Father, uh, this truth is deep and it's somewhat ethereal for most people don't know what it's like to have somebody trying to kill them. And we don't even think in those terms. We do things out of safety because it's a habit or because it's a law. We never expect to get in an accident. We just put the seatbelt on. Lord, I pray that You would help us to understand that in every moment of every day, You have an enemy that is seeking to destroy us because we were made in Your image. And we pray, Lord God, that You would continue to provide that deliverance. That You would continue to give us Your love and Your strength and Your forgiveness. That we would be able to stand against the temptations and the trials that are thrown against us that we might choose righteousness, that we might follow You, that we might yield to Your Spirit so that we might be filled with the power to do what we are incapable of doing ourselves. Lord, I can't quit a habit. I can't change my life situation. I can only make choices. Help me, God, to make godly choices that I might put myself in the places that You would have me to be and that I would exclude myself from those places You would not have me to be. Give wisdom and discernment, I pray. Give strength and boldness. For we do not live in fear of an enemy who is powerless against You. We are blood-bought children of the Most High God delivered by the blood of the Lamb, and we have nothing to fear. 
But Lord God, in that we have to take up that armor and we have to rec recognize our position in You. Not of ourselves, but in You. For I cannot stand against Satan. But in You, I can do all things for You strengthen me. Help us to have that mindset, Lord, where we recognize the threat and we recognize the salvation and we cling earnestly to the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And we'll thank You for it in Christ's name. Amen. I remember one afternoon. <laughs> That's not right. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, walking down the street, Dag downtown Baghdad, my commander, first sergeant major, myself, and my chaplain assistant walking down the middle of the road, because that way you're a little further from the edges, side by each, a couple of meters between us, I felt like I was ten foot tall and bulletproof. Why? Because I'm all that Billy Bad? Nope. Because I had my friends with me. They all had guns. As a chaplain, I didn't carry one. And I'm walking down this street in a war zone, stuff going on all around us, and we just walk in the block. Why? Because I got my friends with me. There are people out here trying to kill you, fool. Nah, I got my friends with me. There is no friend more dear than one who would lay down his life as Jesus did. And we can walk in the midst of the strife and the chaos and the war that is around us with our held head held high because we are walking with Christ. As you go from this place, go in the knowledge that He walks with you. If you will walk with Him, He will keep your foot on the path and He will protect you against those things around you and bring you to the completion of what He's called you to do through His Holy Spirit and through His cross. Amen.